what we have to try to understand is that in her imagination of what is happening in our world, in human reality, if you will, in, in, in history, she can only enter into what we call history, the course of history, by a fictional act in her own imagination. It, that's why you could use the analogy of, a, of an avatar, like an avatar in, uh, I believe, correct me on this, how an avatar is used in, in computer um, lingo and in IT, right? If you have an avatar, you have an alternative identity in cyberspace. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. So uh, she needs an alternative. She needs to create an avatar that appears in human history so that she can engage with us. Do you see what her problem is? Yes. As, as she wakes up. Well, she can't. She doesn't actually appear in human history as a person. What she appears in is she appears in the inner fictional narrative that goes along with human history. She has to find some point of entry, and she finds that point of entry. I think this is what the Turton has discerned so far. And I got all this also in 2008. Uh, she enters into the narrative of history through a kind of literary channel. In other words, there's something that you could call the literary imagination. That is to say, the imagination of the human species, say in the last 2,000 years, that has produced literature. And that has been a literature that has been in the parallel of historical events. One example is the first novelist was actually a Japanese woman called Lady Murasaki. And she wrote a fictional account of the life of her time, which was the, uh, I believe, the 10th century in Japan, which was the early period of the samurai. So you have the historical period of the samurai, and then you have Lady Murasaki inventing Prince Genji, who was an avatar or fictional character in that period. So what Gaia, Sophia, had to do was find an inroad into the human mind through some fictional or literary representation in the historical period when she woke up. Can you follow me on this? Yes. Okay, because this is, I've never tried to explain this before. <laughs> okay. I'm a little bit, so if I'm a little bit awkward about it, bear with me. Oh, no problem. And she found that identity. And it was in a character called Justine. Does that name ring a bell? It doesn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, with, I'm just wondering if anyone, if anyone, if that name happens to ring a bell, especially if you put it in the time period of, uh, around 1776, 1780, the end of the 18th century. Well, Justine is an actual literary character in the writing of that period. But Justine is also the probe or access point for her first lucid identity. And Justine is uh, the name of a novel by the Marquis de Sade. She's the main character in a novel by the Marquis de Sade. And this novel, called Justine, which you can look up on the internet, is a, a pornographic novel of horror. And that is how she woke up. She woke up in a nightmare. Because we are in a nightmare. And the difference now is that she's in this nightmare with us. And since her time is much longer than ours, it takes her 10 minutes to orient herself in her dream. But for us, that runs into 240 years. So we have to bear in mind that her waking up process is very rapid. But for us, it seems to be much longer because one second of her time is equivalent to 108 days of our time. So the first identity that she burst into, the first moment in her imagination when she pictured herself in the human drama with us was as this character, Justine, in the novel by the Marquis de Sade. And if you want to follow the course of her identities, I'm not going to enumerate all of them here, I'm just going to jump to the seventh one in a moment, but if you want to follow the course of her identities, 
it's really important to have empathy for this character to go and read about Justine. You don't necessarily have to read the whole novel, but acquaint yourself with who this character was and then try to take on board the fantastic idea that this was actually the first identity that the planetary goddess realized as she went lucid. She's going lucid. Now, she's not waking up from a dream, by the way. I've mentioned this before. If she wakes up from the dream, the world is over as we know it. But as long as she wakes up in the dream, lucidly, history and life as we know it can continue. So that's when it began. That was her first one. Now we come down to her sixth one, which is VV, which she attained around 1999. So she's been in her sixth dreaming identity for about 12 years now, 12 or 13 years. And this sixth identity that she's in now and the seventh identity have a very fantastic d uh, dynamic connecting them. Because the sixth identity is the one in which we contact her. That's why I say, and you can try it for yourself, don't take my word for it, if you call this name, things happen. If you do the vow and make the vow to this name and in the presence that you bring to yourself, the attention you bring to yourself when you call this name of VV, things happen. This is absolutely real because it is like being in a lucid dream. We are in a dream and it's like the, if you had a lucid dream that was recurrent and you found yourself again and again, say, sitting in a certain cafe in a lucid dream and you're thinking, oh my God, here I am, I'm dreaming but I'm awake in my dream. Oh, I've been to this cafe before. There's a waitress. There's these other people. Oh, and I know the person sitting over at the other table. Hey, Dave. And in the dream, in the lucid dream, you call to the person who is the other character in that dream. We can do that now in her sixth identity. So the sixth identity is what I call the recognition identity. The seventh one is the last one that she'll assume. She only has to assume one more identity. And that seventh avataric identity, which is coming very soon, is the one she assumes after a group has recognized her. It's the identity of full interactivity, total and complete interactivity. So the one she's in now is the beginning of activity. It's our engagement with her. We make the initial contact and we have the instructions of planetary tantra how to practice interactivity. The seventh identity, she assumes a persona, a dream persona in the human imagination that has the capacity to actually intervene in human history directly through the imagination. So I'm a little reticent to talk about this because I don't really feel confident that what I say is clear or comprehensible, but that's my best shot for right now. Wow, thank you. <laughs> well, moving on to the next question, I wanted to know... <laughs> How does one handle and master the process of being jolted by Sophia? And if you could uh, discuss the planetary magic and how it relates to the process of the experience of being jolted. Well, it's sort of like a dance, you know. She dances. She's a dancing thunderbolt. And she dances a kind of tango. And if you look at the tango dance, of course, it's very erotic. It's a, it's a mating, kind of a mating dance. And it's, it's a very outrageous and she's very outrageous uh, in the way that she behaves. But you'll see that there are certain movements in the tango dance when uh, the male counterpart of the dance sort of throws, you know, the woman around. It doesn't throw her around in an abusive way or drag her around by the hair or anything like that. But certain of the tango moves are, are kind of brutal. They're kind of abrupt, you know. And the woman, in turn, when she swings herself around the man's body and there are certain movements you see when she brings her leg up against his thigh 
these kind of movements are the movements of the energy of Gaia in connecting with us. It's not soft and it's not a soft and sweet flow. It's more like a tango dance. And so you asked me how to handle these jolts, or how to dance with her, how to dance with vertaceous lightning. You know, this is what you're asking. How do we <laughs> dance with vertaceous lightning, right? Right. Yeah. Well, very audaciously, very audaciously, but also with uh, precision and immense care to the timing of our moves. Now, what I'm teaching in the Gaia Navigation Experiment involves a practice in timing. I show that two times each month, when the moon is nearest to the earth in its perigee and most distant from the earth in its apogee, that there are surges in the whole energy body of the earth, of the planet. And that at that moment, the wisdom goddess is doing one of two things. She's either activating her imagination, her dreaming attention, to go into, the, into her own memory and recall and recapitulate. Sorcerers recapitulate. The goddess recapitulates because she's a great sorceress, you see. And so there are the moments when she recapitulates and there's a jolt of a certain kind, a sort of soft, expansive blow that rises up from the earth. Then there are the moments when the moon is in its perigee or near point, and that blow, that blow is more precise. That's like a, a blow to your body, and that jolt is felt more deeply, and sometimes it's felt as, a, as an oppression, as a, tire, as a fatigue. Uh, about half the time, I find that I, I, I pass out during these perigee surges. Uh, I can't stay awake, and other people have also mentioned this as well. Other people uh, in the in the crew. So, one way the essential framework for this practice, for this dance with flirtatious lightning, is the timing of these moments. And anticipation is the essence of the game, my friends. Anticipation. You anticipate, but you do not. An you do not know exactly what you're anticipating. You know, it's just like if you're surfing. I haven't surfed very much in my life but i understand that if you're surfing you get up on the wave and how are you going to stay up there and ride that wave well you can't plan what the wave is going to do but you can anticipate how the wave is going to curl and this is what we do with her this is why we practice these moments and so we come up to each moment each surge with a sense of anticipation and with the imagination primed to 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 uh to receive whatever may may be given into your imagination at that time through her imagination. And we also practice surrender at those moments. Uh, sitting quietly, looking at the sky, sitting in some natural place with your feet on the earth, your bare feet in the soil, your back against a tree, looking at the sky, going into empty, empty mind, into silent knowing. Uh, there are all sorts of practices, and, and you probably have your own kinds of practices already that could be adapted to this process. But the main thing is to understand that you're dancing a tango and that the key movements of the dance occur in sudden jolts and to follow the timing of those, according, which is very easy to do, and which uh, you, can, you can look up in any, you know, any astronomy book will tell you, or any astronomy website will tell you when these moments are. So that's basically how it's done, uh, and it becomes really interesting when you do it with other people. Uh, that is to say, when you have a group of people who are observing these same moments, you get a fantastic synchronicity going, and then uh, the members know.